Now, you're an opponent of what you call age segregation in education, and I think more generally in life. Tell us why. I think if you brought people from 300 years ago or 3,000 years ago uh, to live among us now, if you dropped them out of a time machine, I think the first thing that would stun them is just simply our material abundance and our tools, and especially our digital tools, right? We have, we have more built stuff than anybody in human history by, you know, huge magnitudes. And so I don't think you could possibly arrive here and not first be surprised by our material abundance. But I think if those folks stayed with us for a while, 30 days later, that would wear off. And I think the thing that would be most striking to people from other times and places living among us is how age segregated we live. It is a really, really weird thing to allow our 17-year-olds to believe that the world is mostly made up of 17-year-olds. Right? It's, it's strange. It's not healthy, and it's not true. And that's the way we raise our kids. They are hyper, hyper age segregated. And as the father of you know, 15 and 13-year-old girls, um, I get that the pure slight of a 13 or a 15-year-old girl really hurts. But it's not really enduring if you have any wisdom. Right? If, you, if, if your 13-year-old knows 60-year-olds and 75-year-olds, and they've been through a lot of life experience, Another 13 or 15 year old girl saying something trite and mean to you? Like it just, it's water off a duck's back if you have any perspective. And I don't think we're serving our kids very well by allowing them to live these hyper age segregated lives. And I think that's closely connected to the core uh, driver of, I think, our perpetual adolescence category, which is that our kids don't know the distinction in their belly. They don't feel the distinction between production and consumption. They know. Uh, sort of aging through grades in school as their kind of productive work time. And then the rest of life is just different forms of consumption. That's really unsatisfying and it's really unfair to them. Again, this book is not a blame laying book, but if I were laying blame in this book, I would not be blaming millennials. I'm bl I would be blaming we parents and grandparents that we're not helping think with our kids about the fact that we're not celebrating scar tissue with them. And scar tissue is the foundation of future character. And they are able to persevere, and they need to develop a work ethic. And they just happen to live at the richest time and place in human history. And so they live in a life. They live a life that's almost entirely separated from productive work environments. And that's never been the case of anybody who's ever grown up before, that they didn't grow up around work. Well, one of the most basic things that makes you happy in life is thinking that you're needed. My, my work, our work, is needed. Not, you know, uh, not does my back hurt at the end of the day, or not do I think I get paid enough money, or not is there some annoying person three cubicles away who talks too loudly on his or her phone. But when I leave home on Monday morning, or whatever day you begin your, your work day or work week, do I think anybody needs me? If you think that, if your work matters to somebody, if you have a meaningful way to contribute to your neighbor, you're basically gonna be happy. And if you don't have that, you're almost certainly not gonna be happy. And right now, we're raising our teens segregated from work and therefore segregated from any clear sense that they're needed now or gonna be needed in the future. And that ends up feeling a lot like cotton candy. It's pretty Peter Pan-like and pretty miserable. I'm actually a fan of the older 19th century British Lancastrian system where when possible you have the somewhat older children teach the younger children and the older children also learn through teaching not just by being students and you mix roles that way it gives you a natural way to mix ages where there's some rationale for it. I worry also with people aging and going more into nursing homes we will become a more age segregated society. So there's a lot of worry about racial segregation, gender segregation, but age segregation is hardly mentioned. But if you think about it, how old you are is a pretty fundamental fact about your life. And I'm very glad to see your book is drawing attention to this issue. I hope that gains some traction. Thanks. And it isn't just the older. I think you're, I want to underscore your point, Tyler. It isn't just 13-year-olds being around 60 and 75-year-olds, though it should be that, because the, the pattern of life <clears throat> is you start needing diapers and you end up needing diapers, right? I mean, we, we ultimately become dependent again. And that means there are a whole bunch of people that need us, that they need our help. And our kids shouldn't live the narcissistic 13-year-old consumer experience of thinking there's this sort of fountain of youth, and if only they could consume more, they'll be happy. All the data shows that that doesn't actually make 
make you happy. And so there are older people who need us, um, but there are also younger people who need us. And it is a really good way to sort of get outside your own education, to think about how you pass along education. I do think there's a benefit to our, our family structure, you know, providentially just happens to be 15-year-old girl, 13-year-old girl, big gap providential surprise son. And uh, <laughs> it, it is a gift for my daughters that they have to help teach my son because it pulls them out of the narcissistic experience of being 13 or 15. He needs them. They matter. And they learn about their own learning by doing that. One last point. Uh, when I was a college president, uh, we used to host these sort of dinners for donors at our house. We would do these kind of rolling salons of 8 and 10 and 12 people all the time. And one of the questions that my wife and I started to ask people, uh, and it was fun if you were talking to a 45-year-old or an 85-year-old, how do you recognize whether or not a kid or a grandkid is mature? And one time we were hosting this party, and this woman said, oh, that's easy. I, for a boy, I know for sure. If a boy is old enough that I would trust him to be alone with my baby for 90 minutes, such that he <laughs> might have to change a diaper during the time he's there, he's a man. And if he's not, he's still a child. <laughs> There's all these 30-year-old guys around the table who start squirming. <laughs> it's like... Yes, I guess my man cave really is a place that I escaped to be a little kid again. But it was amazing. Immediately, every mom around the table said, oh, yeah, that's it. You know, if, the, if there's an 11 or a 13 or a 15 or a 17 or a 19-year-old boy and you'd think he could take care of a one-year-old for 90 minutes and not have the kid die, he's mature. If not, he's immature. <laughs>